you know, what I want to know is, is how, how does one get involved in doing rock work as a woman? Do you really, really want to know? Or do you just want the rehearsed response that I always give? What would happen if we chose to really tell the truth about ourselves? Like if we really, really just told the real truth of our lives. I'm not saying that it's true. I'm saying that it's my truth. You're listening to him. I had continued to record <clears throat> these morning sessions. And now this so-called podcast, I felt kind of uncomfortable calling it a podcast because all I really knew about podcasts were they were usually these informative either lectures or interviews or talks on some subject or some topic. And so this thing that I had been doing, it, it didn't really... It, for me, it didn't really fall into the category as a podcast, but it really didn't matter. Uh, I was just kind of doing whatever I was told and what was coming to me. And the woman that I had been working with uh, to, you know, lay all of this out and look at it and everything, she had suggested... Um, that we bring in this guy uh, into the fold, and he was a, a media guy, and he worked at the school that she worked at, and he had been one of her students. And she said that he had a lot of experience, and so I met him, and, you know, I was like, okay, like, bring him on board or whatever, and he was going to help with some, um, I guess, maybe promoting the podcast I never really got real clear about what exactly he was going to do, but I was trusting her and I was trusting her judgment. So therefore, I was trusting him and we were going to actually pay him money to help us with this with social media. So the podcast now had a name called Hammered dot 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 stories of an insatiable spirit. And that all came about very quickly. She and I were on the phone one night talking about Greek mythology or whatever. And a few things had come up. And she was talking about, I don't know if it was Thor's hammer or Zeus or somebody got hit in the head. But at the same moment, we both went hammered and then laughed. And it was like, oh, my God, that's it. And it so it came out like pretty funny the way that it that it all fell into place. And... And that was good, and we decided that that would be the name, and then um, we needed a subtitle, and that's how the other part, because I had really thought deeply about what it was that I was trying to, um, you know, set forth, and I didn't have an agenda. I mean, it wasn't a plan, but I knew that that the story or these stories were of a place that I couldn't really describe. The word insatiable was really that craving for knowledge and craving for connection and craving for generosity and craving for love and just craving for an overall you know, satisfaction. I was looking for some sort of satisfaction. 
which really started to lead me to um, investigate unconditional love and what it would be like to live in a world where people, places, and things cannot affect the way I feel unless I give them the power to do so. Now, that being said, that's probably the hardest thing on the planet to come to. I I mean, I don't know if it's even possible, but I felt like the place I was in was I wanted to love regardless of what others thought of me. And I kept thinking about it and I thought, you know, I love you so much, I don't care what you think. And that kept going through my mind, you know, and I was I was working at the real estate girl's house and and, you know, my family, even with my mom, it would be like, I love you so much. I don't care what you think. And and that sort of became a mantra of mine for months because I can't control what people think, what they do, what their process is. But for the most part, I want people to be happy and I want people to to fulfill their dreams and I want them to see their dreams come true. And if I'm a catalyst on this earth to help other people to reach those goals and reach those dreams or tap into a place, then that's good. And I know that way back in the 90s, I remember a French woman told me one time after I'd come back from New Mexico, she says, you're a catalyst. And I said, I don't want to fucking be a catalyst. I want to be catalyzed. I don't think that's a word, but anyway, you know, because I, I, I wanted something good to happen in my life. You know, I wanted to to travel and I wanted to see the world and I wanted to go do these things and have these experiences because really I'm more about an experience than I am an object and I can go all day long and go create these gorgeous scenarios in people's yards and landscapes and all that stuff Um, and leave my mark on the world or whatever and then go return home to my, you know, weedy yard and just my existence of living behind this door of, you know, just the routine of getting up and doing the routine in the morning and going back out each day. It's like sometimes I feel like I have to put on this like armor, this suit, and I put myself in a protective shield because I know that the day is going to bring a lot of challenges. It's going to bring challenges from men and their fucking opinions. And I just say that because it's fucking true. I mean, men, I just wish you could just get your fucking head out of your ass And just be a woman for a day. You know, it's so annoying the way that, and not all men, you know, because I can just hear it now. Oh, there's a lot of good men in the world, Jill. Yeah, there are a lot of good men in the world, but I haven't met them. I've met a few, but for the most part, you know, I have to deal with a whole nother kettle of fish than you're dealing with. You know, when I go into Home Depot or Lowe's or the gravel place, anywhere I go and I'm wearing my ragged ass pants and my work boots and my cut off shirt with my biceps showing, I scare the shit out of them. And they can't understand it and they have to start saying stuff and they have to question and they have to look and they have to get closer. And, you know, it's this I met this one man one day at the at the gravel place and we're waiting in line, you know, in our trucks and we had masks. You know, we're supposed to be wearing the mask. Well, he didn't have one on and I had mine on and I was just standing leaning against my truck and here he comes. And he's like, what you waiting on? And I said sand he's like yeah yeah what's working on i said oh i'm working on a patio or i said something you know and he goes yeah me too i'm working down there on uh, over in west Asheville. i got this uh 
I'm, I'm doing kind of like a, a flagstone basketball court. And I said, really? Because I'd never heard of a flagstone basketball court. But he went on to tell me that he was uh, one of the best Masons in Asheville, or really Western North Carolina. And if I had heard of him and he told me his name and I said, no, I said, but I'm sure that you're real good, you know. And and he went on and on and he told me all about Portland cement and Portland concrete. And I'm just using straight up Portland, you know, I'm using straight up Portland. And I'm standing there and I'm watching his mouth move because he doesn't have his mask on. And, and he's talking all this shit about the the mortar and you know all the technicalities that he's using to do this basketball court and it is smooth as glass i'll never forget and i said oh wow i bet it's gorgeous i bet it's so great and i'm just on and on with before it ends he's like well here take my card here and uh and I, I have a lot of antiques and stuff down at my house. I live down there in Mills River. And, uh, hey, you know, if you want to come over sometime to see my antiques, uh, you're more than welcome to. And I was just standing there looking at him. And I've got my face mask on. So I'm thinking, well, maybe maybe he thinks I'm younger than I am up under this face mask because maybe it's hiding some of my wrinkles. And I'm not really that wrinkled, but... I thought, you know, because I never give myself a break, really, because I'm thinking, why is this man talking to me? I didn't know he was almost sort of hitting on me, which was really weird. Um, and so he goes, you got a card? Because sometimes I got people that want like fountains and stuff. Because when people hear you do water features, they really want to give you the work because nobody wants to do them because they're such a pain in the ass. And there's a lot of liability around it because you got to keep going back because they don't take care of them. And it's a story. I gave him my card and I probably shouldn't have done that because by Saturday, he was calling my phone and inviting me to his house. And... uh and I just, you know, I sent him a text and I said, thanks so much. But, you know, I'm going through a, a divorce and uh, I'm just not ready to see anybody right now. So anyway, that kind of nipped that in the bud. But it was, um, but the whole thing about the whole day and going out in the world and wearing the armor and having to, to go through the gauntlet of life. And I'm sure everybody has their story of that. And some people, maybe they just go out into the world each day all cheery and bright and happy and good for them. I, I want to join them, you know, and I, I know that if I could shift my attitude sometimes that I do have a better time. But it's um, it's a challenge. But I think uh, when I'm working at a place that I enjoy being at, that makes a, a difference. And I think for the months that I was over at this real estate girl's house, I had a connection with all the plant material and I was installing things, uh, you know, spring and these gorgeous rhododendrons and peonies and these just beautiful plants. And, you know, I was I was kind of getting overzealous with it and probably overbuying on some of these things because I would just bring them over. I just didn't care. It's like I'd see it and I'd go, I got to get that. And that was kind of fun because we were both kind of creating this space. And I guess because I don't have a home of my own and I don't have a yard that I can work in or plant anything, it almost kind of felt like I was uh, substituting her place as my own and, and I could like create these things because she was open to that. And I appreciate that. And I love it when people give me uh, creative license to do what I see in my mind's eye because I think that that stuff comes from other other places. I don't think it's just something that you just think up. I think that we're divinely given thoughts and images and that's really what the imagination is. It's like these images that, you know, are coming from somewhere. And so... I had started uh, working over at her, she had a farmhouse uh, kind of out toward, I think it was Alexandria or some area, and I needed space that I could uh, make some benches and some objects that I'd gotten an order for, 
And so I would go out there and there was nobody around. So I was, you know, using a saw and a grinder and making a lot of dust and all that. And it was really peaceful out there. And um, I spent a lot of time, you know, working on these out there. And I just um, had a lot of time of reflection in that spring. And also with that podcast finally got published um, I had no clue what was going to happen with that. And I began to get phone calls and messages. And, you know, um, there were some red flags about certain issues around the podcast. But I, I kept quiet because I felt like um, this person had volunteered their services to come and do this. And, I mean, she approached me. I never sought this out And so I felt like beggars can't be choosers. I need to just be quiet and just do what they say. They're in the theater world. They know more than me. And I knew that wasn't true because I trust my intuition. And I knew that I had a lot to say. And I knew that I creatively, uh, there's a spark inside of me that I've always known that was there. And even before I moved from Atlanta, I had called three acting schools and I told the universe, if any of these call me back and I'm able to enter, I'm going to, I'm going to totally go to acting school because I had enough money from selling my property down there before I moved up to Asheville that I was going to do this garden shop and blah, blah, blah. But there was this little part of me that was like, I I really want to be in that world of movies or screenplays or acting or something. I was so drawn to it as a kid, you know, I was always so drawn to the movies and to that that world. And then, you know, living with an actor for 12 years, I learned a lot about her side of that world, and it was mostly theater, Um, but I I never put myself in a position that that was even a possibility for me because, you know, I had already found this niche of the physical labor world, and I just always felt like that was sort of where I was supposed to be, Um, but I still knew that I had another part that was just not being cultivated, So the podcast was a way to begin to cultivate that part of myself. And uh, I think Anita, my friend that that got me to do the storytelling, was the first person that really kind of brought that out in me and gave me the confidence to go forward. Um, And then when the podcast came and then this other woman came along to to kind of push me a little bit more. I was very grateful for that opportunity and I was very grateful to her and I told her many, many times how much I appreciated her. But I felt like it was never enough. I felt like I could never, ever fill that void in her that she needed to have filled. And I don't think that that's my job uh, to fill someone else's empty void. And I did the best that I could with it, but I knew that it wasn't my issue. And that was that fine line of being codependent and being a caretaker and making sure that everybody's okay versus this is a business, basically. And if there's money being paid out to a person or you know, we need to get clear on some things. And so it's my fault that I did not get more clear about some of the business aspects of this podcast. And so um, I didn't want to create a manifestation of a problem. So I just kept my mouth shut. And so now the podcast had gotten out into the world and it was starting to do its thing. And it was very interesting because some of the feedback I was getting was very um, emotional. I had a lot of people that were very emotional when they were listening to this and they were reaching out to me. And <clears throat> and I was taking it and listening to it and responding. And I didn't hear one negative response. 
over the entire time that this has been out in the world, I haven't heard anything negative. It's been positive and it's been very, um, it's just been very eye opening because I had no idea that it was going to reach this many people on such a large scale. It's just global. It's in over 30, I think it's over 33 countries, but so all of these things are happening, you know, and I'm just kind of rocking along in the world and going to work. And uh, I'll never forget one day we were, I was over at this house and we're working and we hear the ice cream truck and my nephew was with me and he looked at me and I looked at him and we just busted out laughing. And, uh, you know, the ice cream truck, it was just very ironic because of the whole first season of Hammered and the first and second season kind of include that. And uh, it was very, um, it was like a flashback, you know, and, and also when I would do the recordings that early in the morning and then get myself together and go on out to work. By the time I would get to the job, sometimes I was very disoriented. Sometimes I was very um, still in that dimension because I had just, you know, come back out of that past experience where I was reliving it. And it was hard to shake some days. You know, it was very hard to shake, especially some of the stuff with a lot of trauma or you know, jails, hospitals, death, whatever, you know, it was like I would have to really uh, pull myself together, you know, and I'd be talking to some client and they're like mouth is moving and I'm, I'm still standing over at, you know, Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta or something, you know, it was really weird, but, you know, life kept going along and um, I kept getting all these jobs and my real estate friend she had referred me to quite a few people and so we were still in contact you know through that summer and um and so i was uh really hoping and wishing that something would evolve and that we could just have like a real serious come to jesus moment about our connection and um, I did try to communicate a lot of times. And finally, you know, I said to myself, you know, Jill, if you really want to work on this unconditional love thing, then you just got to let all this go and uh, stop, you know, looking for clarity because this person doesn't have any clarity. And, you know, and I even asked her one day and she says, I don't have any clarity. And, and I said, well, you know, I keep asking myself, what is the, the price of admission to try to, you know, have a relationship with you or be in any kind of relationship with you. And she says, it's not worth it. And I go, oh, really? And she says, yeah. And I says, is that what you think? She said, yeah. And I said, okay. And I had to accept that, you know, and, and that was just the place that she was at. And I think, you know, a lot of times we meet people vibrationally where we're at. And, you know, when you're not in the same place with a person vibrationally, most likely you're not going to be able to merge together. And when you do try to force something like that, it's a disaster and it's usually not a good thing. Um, You know, and in my experience of my relationships in my life, it seems like, you know, there might be an attraction there, a physical attraction, an emotional attraction, you know, and but there if there's not a vibrational vibrational match then most likely it could be like a a fleeting love affair or a um you know a a chemistry you know love's anesthesia takes over and there you are and then you jump into a relationship and it's just not right because it's like you're not on the same vibrational uh set point and so i started learning a little bit about that and and trying to trust that within myself and Along this time, this young guy had uh, that had worked with me back probably four years before named Joey, and he's just cute as a button. He's just a precious guy, and he was my nephew Harrison's really good friend, and they had gone to App State uh, in Boone, North Carolina, in college, and they both were anthropology majors, and COVID hit, and but they were working with a guy up in Boone called Eustace Conway, who's got a show called Mountain Man, and 
he's this guy that's, you know, supposedly like a a mountain man, but whatever. Uh, but they had worked doing carpentry work with him, and and they they knew enough to be dangerous. Uh, they're very wet behind the ears. They're very green. They're very young. But he had called me up again and said, hey, you know, I'm coming back to Asheville, and I really, really, really want to work with you, and would it be possible? And I really hesitated because, you know, younger people, they especially guys, they just don't have a clue what they want to do. And they're fly by night and they live in their truck and they live by the river and they, you know, they can leave at the drop of a hat. And I said, look, you know, if you really want to learn this and you really want to come along, I'll be glad to teach you, but you got to make a commitment he was really, really, you know, convincing, and so he came to work, and I really adore him. Like, we really have a good, good, good connection and a good friendship. So we began this work process, and he, we were in two, about two weeks. Well, first week, he smashed three fingers and lost a couple of fingernails, and and I kept saying, get work boots, get steel-toed boots, get steel-toed boots, and wear gloves, and, you know, nobody listens, but... uh so two weeks in, three weeks in, he has an accident on a Friday night on his skateboard and ends up having uh, having to have surgery on his wrist and have a plate and he's going to be out eight weeks. And the other kid that was helping me was my chiropractor's son and he called the same night Joey called and he had COVID. So there I was on this brand new project with about 14 pallets of stone out in the front of the house Jill Haney once again by herself and so I ended up finishing the project and but you know that's the thing is like I never count on anybody because most likely they're going to leave or get hurt or you know it's just it, it it's very rare that it works out it's just it's a very rare thing uh, Lisa Labolita was long term she lasted a year and she had she was on a mission and that's what I try to tell people up front. I try to tell them, like, you know, just use this as a landing place to work, work out, get paid, and to figure it out, you know, figure out what you want to do. Uh, and then, you know, and in that way, because everything's temporary. I mean, come on, it's all temporary because it's life and we will die and life is temporary. So... He finally healed up and he came on back and we proceeded, you know, uh, through the summer. And so I had gone and uh, gotten a pair of trail running shoes because I was going to attempt to start jogging or running. And I would take Minnie up to this place uh, called Curtis Creek down in Old Fort and walk in the the forest on these roads. There was like kind of like gravel road bond kind of roads that are easy to walk on and started taking that little dog up there and and really to try to just gain some peace within myself. And uh, and as I would go, you know, I would just really try to focus on detaching from my feelings that I had for this this person, this woman, this real estate girl that I had known for so, 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 so long, and I knew I really, really, really needed to let it go, and um, and then I had a call from a guy, and I was about to leave my house, and I get this call, and this name came on my phone, and it was like, why, why does a name come up on your phone if they're not in your caller ID? And I saw this name, and it looked like a familiar name, but anyway, he left a voicemail, and he had a really nice voice, and the way that he talked was very um, humble and kind, And but he said, hey, Jill, you know, and he says his name, and he goes, uh, I bought a house, and I think you did the stonework, and he gave me the address, and he goes, I, I got a, a couple of issues, you know, with I need some repairs on something and blah, blah, blah. And, and so I listened real close to the message and then I Googled the address. And when I found the address, it had a drone video of this massive house with a pool and it went over the house. And I'm looking at it and I thought, I've never seen that house in my life. 
And I thought, how does he think that I did any work there? Because I didn't. So I just called him back. And it was it was raining that day. And I go, hey, you know, you just left me this message. And I said, where'd you get my number? And he goes, uh, you know, I don't know, really. He goes, I, three different people gave me your number. And I said, three? And we were laughing. I said, well, I guess, you know, three's a charm or whatever. Three's a lucky number. And he started telling me that he was having water go into the downstairs. And it was going into this, you know, he was worried it was going to get in control panels and all this stuff. And there was something about the way that he spoke to me and talked to me that, and I never do this. I never drop what I'm doing. And I said, you know what? I'm going to come over there. I'll just, I'm just going to come over there right now. And he said, okay. And I don't know what caused me to do that, but I got my truck. I went up to his house. I go up this big, long driveway and... I get to the door and it's got one of those kind of, you know, like a speakeasy. It's got like a little window, little door thing with a little bars on it. And I actually stuck my hand in it before I knocked on the door. And then I knocked on the door, you know, and and I thought, I hope there's not cameras out here because I just did something silly. But anyway, so he comes and I see him kind of like an Adidas hat, sort of. And I thought, who is this? And when I was talking to him on the phone, I was expecting to see some sort of like khaki pants, golf shirt kind of guy, right? And here comes this guy, he opens the door, and he's like full Adidas, warm up, shoes, hat, uh, two diamond earrings, some chains. And the first thing I'm thinking is, okay, he's in the music business. He's, he's like a rapper. Or he's, you know, it's assumption, assumption, assumption. Um, he's a white guy. You know, he's got this this little beard. And uh, he had a lot of tattoos. And he was just very interesting. And we get to talking. And the house is almost sort of empty. And he said, yeah, you know, I've been here since January. And I think at this time it might have been maybe August. And maybe it might have been July. I can't remember. But um so anyway, I get a hatchet and an axe and a hammer, and I start knocking some of the flagstone flagstone off the porch. And I found the water uh, tributaries immediately, and I said, "Well, I can see where the water's going in." And so um, he really wanted me to get started on all this, but I was hesitant because I didn't know him, and I didn't know I don't want to be responsible for water damage problems, and I want to make sure that things are uh, not coming from some other source. And so we got a water expert guy to come out there. Uh, my real estate friend, she knew a guy that we, he came out and scoped it out. And he said, Jill, I think you're safe to do the job. And, uh, and so little did I know that, that this job was going to be a journey that, you can't make up. You just can't make this stuff up. And somehow, some way, the universe or our vibrations, our attractions, the law of attraction, I don't know what it is. But somehow, some way, we all find each other. Hammered is recorded and produced in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. It's narrated by Jill Haney, produced by Maggie Briggs and Jill Haney, and with sound design, editing, and music by Alexander Rodriguez. Our beautiful artwork was created by Lauren Caddick, and we'd like to send a special thanks out there to Minnie and Robin. You can check out our website, podcasthammered.com, and follow us on social media for updates.